Welcome to a Wiser Retirement Podcast. Before we get started with the episode, I want to tell you about a new ebook available on our website called Buyer Beware. Why do they keep trying to sell you that annuity? This ebook covers the various types of annuities, negatives to owning annuities, and better investment alternatives to annuities. To download this ebook, you can click the link in the episode notes or go to wiserinvestor.com and you'll find it at the bottom of the page. Now on to today's episode. Welcome to the Wiser Retirement Podcast. We believe the best financial advice should always be conflict-free. I'm your host, Casey Smith, guiding you to financial freedom today. It's my co-host, Michaela Dowdy. Hey, Michaela. Hi, Casey. So before we get started, uh, today we're going to talk about five uh, common financial myths. And these myths are, I'm excited about these. These are not something we just found on the internet, right? These are These are five myths that we have kind of uncovered in our financial planning. Yes, they're the ones we're seeing day to day um, through all of our clients here lately. So before we get started, though, there's a bonus feature here. Actually, it's kind of sad. Um, this made me very angry when I when I went through this um, article. Uh, it was published back on July 20th uh, by CNBC, uh, referring to a uh, former now Morgan Stanley broker that stole um, over $7 million from his clients and it was pretty close to home. I mean, Wilmington, North mm-hmm. Carolina, right? Um, just a very sad situation. And this is like the public service announcement, I guess, of, <laughs> of this. You never, before I get in, I'll tell his story, but before you, ne- before we get into that, just remember one thing you never write a check to your financial advisor or to the firm of the financial advisor. If you're an independent like us, Mm -hmm. you would never write a check to wiser wealth management ever, unless you're paying for like hourly financial planning or something like that, but never an investment Mm -hmm. check ever. Um, so basically what he did over several years is he convinced clients to leverage their portfolio. So they bought through a Morgan Stanley product allows you to borrow money against your brokerage account hand him the money personally. So didn't write it to a th- an entity, <laughs> no audit trails, no nothing. Um, hand it to him personally, he would invest the money in different things. And there were no checks and balances. I think he probably preyed on the people that were the least educated about investing, but basically just went and spent all the money. And only was found out, not by Morgan Stanley, <laughs> Morgan, Morgan Stanley had no clue this was going on. They're in charge of the oversight of the broker. They had no clue this was going on. And um, in the end, a client had turned turned him in and said, hey, something's not right here. Uh, and they profile in the article, they profile um, uh, a, a young lady, single mom, uh, $1.7 million in liquid assets. And basically, um, he took it to zero. Just heartbreaking. It is. Um, and I tell people all the time, I said, the barrier to entry um, to be a financial advisor is very, very low. Anybody can go do it. And therefore, we have a lot of people in this business that are crooks. Mm-hmm. And some of them are legally crooks. <laughs> the ones that are selling annuities. You know, we, yeah. we have a new client recently. And this was he probably in his 30s when, when he was sold an annuity. If not his 20s. I think we had actually backdated it and he was like 27 when he got put into an annuity. That's crazy. It and, is. And, the, and the, we found out the lady that sold him the annuity is no longer li- uh, allowed to practice. <laughs> exactly. <Yes. laughs> Lost her license. Um, so you, you just... It's such, it's such hard, you know, I have, I have lost prospects, not so much in the last couple of years, but especially, especially when I was just starting out that said, well, we really like your concepts and what you're offering. But if we go with a big firm, then we feel like we have more protection if something bad were to happen. I mean, I guess they're alleging fraud or something like that. But um, in the end, Morgan Stanley is one of the biggest advi- advisory firms or stock brokers out there. Exactly. And they, they're refusing to, um, refusing to have any ownership in this. And so the, the, the victims of this Ponzi scheme, um, are suing Morgan Stanley, mm-hmm. but they were, they're refusing to really cooperate, uh, uh, in, in working with the victims. It did say further down in the article that there were a couple of victims that they had settled with. So my only okay. guess is, is 
those victims are probably saying that's not even my signature on the loan <laughs> or something along those lines. Oh, right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you just, it, it's, um, it's, a, it's a real sad situation and it is certainly avoidable. Um, and it's, it's avoidable by, by having checks and balances between TD Ameritrade and Schwab and Wiser Wealth Management, there's a wall. And then even when in cases where uh, I'm a trustee for a family, uh, but there are still audits that happen on an annual basis, and those audit report audit reports are turned over to the um, to the families. And so, uh, even when we ran private equity many many years ago, um, those were audited, and audit reports were turned over. Every single penny is accounted for. So there's there's checks and balances that have to uh, go into place, but you, you don't ever um, write a check directly to a financial advisor. That's, that's dangerous. Yes. And illegal for the advisor to take. Mm -hmm. my, my, you know. No, exactly. <laughs> it's, on top of that. it's all, it's all bad all <laughs> around. And it's so wonder that it didn't get caught throughout um, the auditing process in some way, shape or form. Yeah. But, I guess the sneaky part was it was a, it was a Morgan Stanley loan product. And so once the money left, Morgan Stanley doesn't track where it goes. So exactly. in their defense, um, how are they supposed mm -hmm. to know that it was all, um, that it was all fraudulent? Yeah. Although, uh, they did interview one of, uh, I guess, his coworkers, and they were like, his lifestyle didn't add up to the size of business he had. Oh, saying he was taking mm -hmm. all these worldwide trips, oh, really, really lavish uh, trips, and and um, he, he he always wondered why, how he was able to do it because <laughs> <laughs> because they probably made about the same amount of money, and there you go. Yep. Um, that's, that's how that happens. Uh, okay. So let's, let's hop into our, our list here. Um, surprise me. So we're gonna yes. go with, we're gonna go with five. Yes. Um, and this, a lot of these, you, you came up with these on your own. These are uh, ones that you've seen with Missy as you guys do financial planning. Yes, exactly. So these are the ones that we're seeing day in, day out. Um, clients, as we talk to them for consultations or whether they're coming in for the entire financial planning process and we're walking through that with them, it ends up that a lot of these are the questions and the misconceptions that a lot of our clients have. Um, and with our broad range of a client base, if we're having four or five clients with these same thoughts, then it's pretty widespread out there. And so the biggest one we've had here lately is people thinking that they're meeting their max on their 401k by matching their employer match, which is great. We love an employer match. It's great to make sure you're maximizing that benefit. And that's always your baseline is you really want to meet that employer match. Um, but that's not the maximum you can contribute to a 401k. And so that's been um, the crazy thing here lately that we're seeing a lot of people um, come in with is they're like, yeah, I maxed out my 401k. And you're like, great, that's <laughs> right. phenomenal. We love that. Um, and then we get to the design meeting when we're actually looking at the plan and they're like, I don't contribute that much. And we're like, okay, like, let's go back then. And they're like, yeah, I match the employer match. And we're like, okay, so you can actually contribute um, 22,500 for the 2023 year. And then if you're over 50, you can contribute an additional 7,500, you know, bringing that up to 30,000 a year. So it is a great benefit to have. Um, and we love to see those employer matches, but that's not the max you can contribute. Yeah. I, I've, I've seen that too over the years is they, they max it out. Um, and you always have to ask like a, a clarifying question. Mm -hmm. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of people who do actually max it yes, out. So, exactly. so you, you kind of go through a string of those and <laughs> you, you think that you're, you're on the same page. But sometimes with income, you know, someone making just starting out making 50,000 years, probably not maxing mm -hmm. out their 401k at 22,500. But exactly. you never know. Um, OK, that's that's a uh, th that's a good another good public service announcement. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you can put more in than the match percentage. Yes. Um I have seen a few 401k plans that limit you to 50% of your income, uh, but most of them do not. You can put in uh, as, mu as much as you want to, as much money as you have yes. in your in your paycheck. No, definitely. Up and to the max. Yes, yes. So definitely a great benefit there um, to make sure that we're, you know, encouraging our clients to contribute as much as they can to that benefit. Okay, what's next? Yeah. 
So next one is um, really going into your HSA. So another thing that employers are really um, on top of. And so that can not only just be used for your current medical expenses, but that's also a great retirement tool as well. And so that's one of those things where you actually have a maximum to contribute there of the $38.50 if you're an individual or the $77.50 if you're um, with a family and contributing. And so that's a great spot um, to really be putting away retirement savings um, because we're just seeing healthcare expenses go skyrocket through the roof. Um, So as those continue to increase, we really want to see clients use that more of a tool for retirement. So the myth here is that if you have an HSA and you're contributing to it, you have to use that money. Um, I guess they get confused probably with FSAs, flexible yes. spending accounts, mm-hmm. which are more focused on like PPOs or exactly. HMOs. Mm-hmm. Um, so the idea is if you have plenty of cash flow, you would pay for that out of pocket. You allow, allow the HSA to build. It's almost, it's kind of like a Roth for healthcare. Mm-hmm. So exactly. it keeps building. And then once you hit retirement, you can use that HSA money towards your Medicare premiums. Yes. Yes, which is a great tool to have, especially, I mean, I think we have it right now projecting out um, and what we've seen with our Money Guide Pro software and just the statistics here lately is um, healthcare is growing at a four and a half percent on average a year um, for cost. And so that's just a major expense for um, anyone to be taking on um, if you're doing privatized healthcare in retirement. Yeah, Uh, actually with the new model update inside our software, I think it's like 5.3 now. I saw that yesterday. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's, it's kind of running away from mm-hmm. you. It's almost as bad as, uh, education. Expenses. It is. Yes. Uh, yeah. And for 20 year olds, um, and the people in their twenties, when you do planning for them, you know, their, their healthcare expense in the future is hor- horrendous. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a problem that has to get solved. But right now as planners, all we can do is just plan for the worst. And, uh, hopefully that becomes spending money instead of <laughs> medical yes. money. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. And so our next thing talking about high expenses um, is renting is throwing your money away. As we all know, renting's going through the roof here that's, lately. That's an interesting comment. So ex- <laughs> explain, please. Yes. So a lot of people feel like, um, and it's out there, and I've even been guilty of this thought of myself at different points of that renting, if you're renting, you're not building equity. And so you're just throwing your money away. There's no benefit to renting. Um, and at the end of the day, especially right here and now for 20 somethings or even 30 somethings that are really living in this renting environment. And it's really a struggle to get into home ownership here lately, especially now with the interest rates being so high. Um, it is something that it can feel like renting's throwing your money away. Um, and that you're just kind of not building up your own equity. You're just giving it to, you know, the next person, um, and they're getting to get rich off of your rent. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's where people get kind of stuck in that rent cycle of, oh no, I'm stuck renting. But in reality, if that's the season of life you're in, then that's a great benefit. Um, and to think you're not having those overhead household expenses, um, that so many people like don't even factor in when they're buying a house. I don't think any, any young person probably does. I've, we've Mm -hmm. had some conversations with some older people that, or trying to buy way too much house uh, for what they need. But, mm-hmm. you know, you, you figure, you know, a refrigerator goes out today. That's like $3,500. And mm-hmm. I, I guess if one goes out to your apartment, you're still replacing it. But roof, mm-hmm. uh, lawn care, caring for the house. Exactly. You know, it's like if you, you know, at, at my house, I have not, the not so good siding, but it's fine as mm-hmm. long as you have it cleaned and caulked every year. Gotcha. Right. Yeah. Most people mm-hmm. wouldn't do that. And mm-hmm. so their house, the, the siding deteriorates mm-hmm. and then it, it, they have to spend $50,000 to reside their mm-hmm. entire, entire house. Those are things that people don't think about. So I, I can see that. I mean, I would have a hard time. Maybe this is the age difference between you and me, but I think I would have a hard time renting now partially because I want to make sure that I have homes that are paid off by the time mm-hmm. I retire. So it is a point at some which at some time and you want to make that leap. Exactly. But what your point is, is that what you're thinking that people would change jobs. They wouldn't stay in the same location or yes. Why, think, why is it better to rent now than it is to buy? Yes. Yeah, so I think right now you're seeing a lot of people are doing 
a different lifestyle, I think, especially in the 25 to 30 somethings, um, you're seeing a lot of people that are either working from home part of the time. And so they're traveling a lot or it's even that they're even kind of doing the digital nomad lifestyle a little bit, or it's one of those things too, where people are doing, I think loyalty is no longer as rewarded as it used to be in the workforce. Um, and so I think you're seeing a lot of people that are jumping positions at different points. And so they're no longer staying in one place long. And I think that's part of, you know, social media, I think too, is the grass always seems greener somewhere else, you know? And so I think that's where you kind of have that where a lot of people that are working at corporate firms or those kinds of things are like, well, you know, I've been here two years, I'm going to go get my pay bump and move on um, somewhere else. And so I think that's where you have this almost unsettling spot where people aren't really settling down yet. And so I think if you're not in that settling down part of your lifestyle yet, then renting can be a great opportunity for you to just kind of keep living life and not have to take on those additional expenses so that, you know, when your, you know, HVAC unit goes out, that's not on you. Yeah. That's on someone else. Or, um, if the roof needs a repair, then you just call maintenance and they fix it for you. Um, or it's even if you're trying to, I think, save, I think that that can be a great space to also kind of help, um, if you're doing renting. Cause I think the big thing is, is where you're seeing these huge skyrocketing rent prices really aren't in a majority of areas. I mean, that's your New York, that's your San Francisco, that's your like London, UK. Those are the places where you're really seeing these astronomical rent. And that's just because they don't have the housing for it anymore. And so I think that's where, um, if you're living your day-to-day life in a normal city, like Marietta, Georgia, right. you're, you're really not struggling with that renting cost as much. Okay. I think I might be able to buy that a little bit. I think mm-hmm. what a takeaway is, I think for our older listeners, if your grandkids yes. are le- renting, don't be ashamed. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's a little, it's a little different time now. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> because you know, the down payment on a house now is going to be at least $50,000. Oh, definitely. And um, I know like, and you're probably going to have to, that you're going to have to move pretty far North mm-hmm. away from your job. Yes. Most likely. Yeah. And um, I know like it's very different, especially when I'm just even talking to my parents or grandparents. And they're like, yeah, I bought a house as soon as I graduated high school. <laughs> and it's like, how did you buy a house? Right. <laughs> you know? So it, it definitely is a different world and a different time. I know if you look at the statistics on housing prices, which is a whole nother conversation, um, it's astronomical compared to the growth in wages. So definitely different ball game than it used to be. Yeah. That's part of the thing I think about like legacy planning for families. So for families or ultra high net worth families is, you know, um, that's another great place to have like seed money for the next generation. Um, it could be seen as an an entitlement possibly, but it's, you know, when you think about families that have excess capital, um, so they, they have enough plenty for them and maybe they have brothers or sisters that have plenty for them and they, they basically form like their own bank. So they have this pool of money, that's put in equally by the family members and you can borrow from things like that. Right. Exactly. So that that's uh, another reason to, to keep building wealth and, and look for ways to help the next generation with it. Yes. And while we're on renting, a huge thing that's come up in our client meetings is that rental properties are passive income that you can just buy a rental property (laughs) and all of a sudden you're going to be rich. You're never going to have to work. Yes, in a way, yes. Okay. It's kind of a sub point, I guess you could say more <laughs> so. But um, that's another um, debunking, I guess, that has to take place in our client meetings is helping them understand that rental properties are great and they are a great way to diversify your portfolio, but it is something that they're not purely passive income, um, like no. a lot of things make it seem. No. Mm-mm. no. Well, so, I, you know, there, there's the there's the rental that you just buy and you put – someone rents it from you and they live full time and they sign a one year or two year lease. Right. And then there's the vacation rentals, which require more work, but Mm -hmm. theoretically you could drive more revenue from the property and be able to use it yourself. But yes, what people don't take into account there is you usually get a loan. So you can get a mortgage, you buy the house and then you rent it out. 
Well, it's cash free income. And CBC is really guilty of this too. They, they talk about, Oh, this young person built this, you know, $1 million company and drives 1 million revenue. Mm -hmm. Never tell you what the net is. (laughs) (laughs) You'd be moving a million dollars worth of product, but what did that product Mm -hmm. cost to manufacture? And they never cover any of that. But the, um, uh, so anyway, you, you, you put money down, you buy the house and you depreciate that house over 29 and a half years. So the good part is you have the depreciable um, value of the home. Mm-hmm. So that means any income you get probably is not going to overcome the depreciation in most cases. Mm-hmm. So it's really tax-free income. But then that income has to turn back around to pay for the note. So exactly. the interest becomes deductible. So it really ends up being a loss. Yes. But most people in this situation are not going to be able to claim the loss anywhere. Mm-hmm. So the loss just goes back to the basis of the home. The value of the home hopefully increases. So that's really what mm-hmm. you, it's a long game. Yes. So the value of the home goes up. Someone else is paying the mortgage. It goes down. But you don't just buy a house and then you start collecting rent. Now, we do have a few clients who have done that. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and they paid $2 million for a beautiful beach home and paid cash. And now it's it's it rents positive mm-hmm. cash flow. Um, but that's typically not how most people do it. But exactly. if you're in your late thirties, early forties, that's really the time to start doing it because you can get, you know, they have this long runway to that the time you hit retirement that all that should be paid off. So it's not that it's a bad idea, mm-hmm. uh, but when something breaks or, yes. you know, exactly it, it's, it's, it's work. Mm-hmm. It's work, especially, um, you know, making sure that the home home for vacation rentals, make sure the home is cleaned and ready to go for the next person. Not that, that I'm cleaning it, mm-hmm. but you have to coordinate people. And what if they don't show up? Then what are you going to do? Yes. Right. Mm-hmm. So you're, you kind of turn into a hotel <laughs> of some sort for the short-term rentals and yes. then long-term rentals. Uh, I just worry that, are they really caring for my home? Or if they leave was, what am I going to find? Um, if they stop paying, that's a whole process now. That's very different than it was maybe 10 years ago. Um, But yeah, it's not a walk in the park, but it's not a bad idea, but you have to set your expectations. Um, And I have, I have worked with counsel, you very, very young people who think I'm just going to buy a bunch of rental properties. (laughs) (laughs) Like, okay, you can do that, but it's, it's not, you're you're not working a full-time job and doing that at the same time most likely when you own 10 of them. Mm -hmm. No, it becomes its own job at that point. (laughs) And so Unless you're hiring, I guess, one of those management companies, then it helps. Yes. But then you're cutting into your bottom line. Oh, as I say, you're giving Mm -hmm. up 30 to 40% of your revenue, Mm -hmm. uh, gross revenue, which is even worse uh, for someone else to manage the property. Now, you can get away with that in, I think, larger properties that are renting out for 12,000, 13,000, 15,000 a week. Mm -hmm. But the smaller properties, it's harder because you have higher fixed costs that go along with that. Yes. Where those fixed costs um, in a larger home uh, that has a bigger rental rate mm-hmm. um, is it, it's not as noticeable on the bottom line. Um, but yeah, I, I hear that all the time. Yes, which hopefully when people are buying those houses and wanting to do rentals, the best long game I feel like, in my opinion, would be to get a house somewhere that is where you potentially want to like live in retirement if you're wanting yeah. to do a move. Yeah. Because then it's fully paid for and then you sell your house where you're currently living with your job and then move down to your beach house. <laughs> True. Or or even think about this. Um, what if, if you were a young person and you were renting in the city where you worked Mm-hmm. But then when you bought your first house, you actually buy the vacation rental as your first house oh. and you rent that out. So you're paying that mortgage, there you but go. someone else is paying it. Yeah. So if you, you want to do like a first time home buyer loan on it too. Is that, well, Kinda. you got to convince them that you're going to live there. there. That's true. Yeah, never mind. That didn't work. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but you might be able to swing it. Just don't tell the um, <laughs> real estate agent or, or the closing people and you might be able to swing that. I don't know. Um, but yeah, so it, it, that, yeah, that, that's a lot of, um, that's a lot of, uh, uh, good advice there. Yes. And then speaking of retirement, I think our last little note here is that your expenses decrease in retirement. Yeah. I, I think it just depends. Um, I'd say that we have a lot of clients who say, well, we have clients all of, across the spectrum. We have people that, they didn't have 250,000 a year, the sky's falling. Mm-hmm. And we have very nice people that live on about 35 to 40,000 a year. They're as happy as can be. 
And so it just depends on what your lifestyle is, obviously. Yes. Um, I think when you're not going back and forth to work, you're not being as tempted to make purchases or buy things mm -hmm. that, that you, you, you do spend less in retirement. But for people who are, you know, got to keep moving. Yes. Or have grandkids mm -hmm. that they're spending more time with. Yeah, it definitely goes back up or stays the same at least. Yes. No, and I think that's what we're seeing with a lot of clients when they come in. It's a lot of getting the realistic um, thought process on what your expenses are in retirement. So it's a lot of, uh, we've had some clients lately that have came in and they're like, we can live on 2500 to 3000 a month. And you're like, <laughs> oh, okay, no, you make, you know, 250000 Like, let's, right. let's be honest, that would not work. Or sometimes people um, think, what do I need? And they only calculate their utilities. Exactly, yes. And some basic, basic food. They don't ever, for some reason, they don't price in the lifestyle stuff. Yes. And that's the part, um, the lifestyle part, as I believe what really goes up in retirement is that you're, you know, hopefully you're, you know, getting to take full advantage of your go-go years if you want to. And um, that's where a lot of our clients are wanting to do travel or, you know, go and see the grandkids if they live far away and just those kinds of things or even, you know, get more involved in the community. And then that takes um, some of their money as well or adds an additional expense um, to their lifestyle. So definitely something there of just making sure you're having the realistic mindset because, while your expenses probably do decrease in retirement and we aren't necessarily debunking this myth, it is something that um, it's likely that your lifestyle expenses are going up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's a saying that you have your um, go, go years, your slow go mm -hmm. years and your no go years. So it's going to definitely change. And sometimes in our planning, what we can do is give a larger travel budget at the beginning mm -hmm. and then, um, we, we back that off cause you're probably not moving around as much, you know, when you're 75 or 80 necessarily. Exactly. Um, so we, we can plan for that in the, in the cash flow of the, uh, of the plan. But yeah, I think it's honing in to what is it you're going to be doing and what is the real cost of that? Mm -hmm. Uh, and there are some people acknowledging that there are some people who their whole thing is to sit and do nothing, you know? <laughs> yes. <laughs> hey, I, you know. After you've worked and that long, you know, that would be, that'd be nice. <laughs> Maybe a year of that. <laughs> right. Sit, sitting and doing nothing. I feel like a lot of our pilot families um, tend to be more stationary, mm -hmm. um, especially the pilots themselves because they've Definitely. been moving around so much, uh, surprisingly, actually. Uh, okay. Uh, well, those are our five things that yes. you and uh, Missy team uh, – Missy and, and Michaela have, M &M team. have, have <laughs> seen uh, through our planning processes um, over the last uh, over the last year. Um, we have some other things you can listen to. Episode 170, How Much Money Do You Need to Retire? Uh, is a good episode for that. Um, we also uh, have some videos out there on our YouTube channel. Uh, it's called A Wiser Retirement. Is financial planning different than wealth management? And then our annuities a good retirement strategy. Uh, those are also available um, in our show notes here. Uh, thanks for listening to today's episode. If you're interested in learning more about Wiser Wealth Management or want to schedule a consultation to meet with one of our fiduciary financial advisors, you can do so by going to wiserinvestor.com or you can click the link in the episode notes. Thanks, Michaela. Thank you. See you next time. Thanks for listening to a Wiser Retirement Podcast. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Make sure to subscribe wherever you're listening. That way you don't miss any new episodes. We'd also appreciate if you could leave a rating and review. If you have any questions about anything that was discussed today, head to wiserinvestor.com and reach out. This episode was produced and edited by Ken Hoadley. This podcast is strictly for informational purposes only and is not to be considered as investment advice or solicitation to buy or sell any financial products, securities, digital assets, or any other investment vehicles or a basis to make any financial decisions. Wiser Wealth Management Incorporated is a registered investment 
advisor with the SEC. The host and or guest may personally own securities, digital assets, or other investment vehicles mentioned on this podcast. Neither the host nor guest of the show are compensated for their participation, and no referral fees are paid to or received by any host or guest for clients, listeners, or similar interests. Investments involve risk, and unless otherwise stated, are not guaranteed. Be sure to first consult with a qualified financial advisor, tax professional, insurance professional, and or legal professional before implementing any strategy discussed herein. Past performance is not indicative of future performance.